Hi there, and welcome to Canada. The first time I get to say that on the channel. It's always seemed a bit odd to me that I almost went to school in Canada, and yet I've never visited Toronto. So I decided four hours in the airport today was a great start. I just got off of an Air Canada Express flight from Philadelphia, and I'm now waiting for leg two of six on this doozy of an itinerary to get me to Muscat Oman. This first ticket is from Philadelphia to Brussels. Originally, it was via Toronto and London, but then my London to Brussels flight was canceled and Air Canada automatically rerouted me with an additional stop in Geneva. In the end, I would only end up landing in Brussels 40 minutes later than originally scheduled. And frankly, I was just so impressed that I was given a new itinerary instantly that I just decided to go with it. After all, I'm always happy to have a little extra Swiss in my life. Enough about that. While I get lost for my first seven minutes in this airport, let me welcome you to the channel. My name is Kevin and I am the Flip Flop Traveler. I'm here to give you honest content about flights, hotels, trains, and cruises. I paid for this trip out of pocket, and the price that I paid is in the description below. Air Canada had no knowledge I'd be filming today, and I didn't receive any compensation from them. Though part of this video is sponsored by Level 8 Luggage. Everything in this video is my personal opinion based on my unique experience. The rest, I'll let speak for itself. Let's get started. I'm flying in Signature Class today, what Air Canada calls their business class but I won't have the supposed pleasure of visiting the Air Canada Signature Suite Lounge. This ticket was booked with points, which automatically makes it ineligible for the Signature Suite, since that's only for business class passengers who paid with cold hard cash. That said, the Maple Leaf Lounge was in fact nicer than I was expecting. The decor felt a little bit like Air France and Swiss had a baby around 2005, but the seats were comfortable and there were plenty of outlets, the food was pretty basic. Today seemed to be tomato day. Booze was freely and quickly flowing in all directions as well. The whole lounge had a definite, we're going on vacation vibe. It was actually kind of nice. And surely if you're going on vacation, you're going to need some reliable baggage. And that's why this portion of the video is sponsored by Level 8 Luggage. Y'all know I always prefer to carry on, but sometimes you just have a bunch of extra clothes or souvenirs, or in my case, 35 pounds of dog treats and chihuahua-sized orthopedic mattress toppers. Yeah. Anyway, for those times, I need to pull out the big guns. In this case, the 28-inch Voyager trunk. Truth is, I was never really that picky about my checked-in baggage before, but now I get it. Key points here. Built into the Macrolon polycarbonate shell is the wide stance handle that I've come to love so much. It makes pushing this thing effortless. Second thing, that handle smack in the middle of the front of the bag. I honestly don't understand why doesn't every bag have this? Lastly, besides the great interior organization, I can't get over how stable the shape of this bag is, helped in part by the wide handle. Even when it's full, you, you really can't tip it over. If you don't believe me, I encourage you to go get your suitcase, fill it to its brim, and then try to push it around like I am right here, on carpet. So if you or someone that you love deserves an awesome new bag, Click the link in the description below and make sure to use the discount code KEVIN10 at checkout for 10% off of your purchase, which would bring this bag to under $300. Thanks to Level 8 Luggage for their support. So as we walk around, I know the question that is front of mind for you at the moment is probably why YYZ, right? No? Okay, well, I'm sure it is now. YYZ is the airport code for here at Toronto Pearson International Airport. And I had two questions. Why do almost all Canadian airports start with Y? And then also, why YZ? So back in the 30s, the US and Canada used two letter codes for airports. Aviation grew quickly and they realized a third letter would be needed and so they started adding them. In the US, when at all possible, they just tacked on an X to the end of it, hence LAX. In Canada, when they used two letters, they also had a classifier in front of the two to distinguish if an airport had a radio station or not. They used Y for yes and W for without. So Canada just decided to officially adopt all of those Ys and voila, we solved the Y. First one at least. As for the YZ, back in the day, Malton, Ontario's code was YZ and that is the same area where Pearson stands today. Now we can all sleep better tonight.
Located to the northwest of downtown Toronto, YYZ is the largest and busiest airport in all of Canada and the largest hub for Air Canada. There are two terminals. Terminal 3 is essentially the everyone else terminal, and Terminal 1, where we are now, is home to Air Canada and all of their Star Alliance friends, as well as Emirates. Both terminals handle domestic and international traffic, but each is split into specific gates for domestic, transborder, and international flights. Air Canada's routes can be traced back to 1938 when the government created TransCanada Airlines. Eventually in 1965, they changed their name to Air Canada. Their first ever flight was for male and two passengers from Vancouver to Seattle, with tickets starting for $14.20 round trip. I presume that's the 1938 version of flying Emirates first class these days. Air Canada was privatized in 1988 following the government's decision to deregulate the Canadian air market. Post-privatization and following the Open Skies Agreement between the US and Canada that started in 1995, they quickly added 30 transborder routes. These days, Air Canada flies to 20 domestic cities, 27 in the US, and 67 other international destinations. Note that this does not include their subsidiaries, Air Canada Rouge, which is their leisure carrier, and Air Canada Express, though they do overlap some of the cities. On a number of daily flights basis, they're currently the 13th largest airline on Earth, with a total of 188 aircraft in their fleet and 109 on order. Today we'll be flying on one of their 777-300ERs, of which they have 21. I was on the last London flight of the night, actually might have been the last European flight of the night, and the airport definitely started to quiet down and just close up shop by the time we began boarding. Wasn't helped by the fact that our boarding was about an hour late. Our aircraft landed late in from Vancouver and then needed to be towed to us from the domestic gate. Despite everyone clearly getting a bit antsy, boarding was well organized. As we head down the jet bridge, let's take a look at tonight's flight stats. I'm not asking this with a bit of shade, but is greeting passengers at the door not a thing on Air Canada? I got some very friendly hellos from 4 or 5 crew as I walked to my seat, but it just didn't seem like anyone cared about the door itself. Air Canada operates two versions of the 777-300ER. The difference between the two being whether or not there's a single business class cabin or two of them. Tonight's aircraft has two, and I was quick to book the second bulkhead seat. The second one being my favorite seat on any aircraft, just about. You get bulkhead space, but with engine views. Let's take a look at the layout. They use the very popular Collins Aerospace Super Diamond Reverse Herringbone Seat, that's a mouthful, which you'll find on dozens of airlines in a one-to-one -one configuration. Our aircraft has 40 business class seats spread over 11 rows. Rows 7 and 8 should be avoided for proximity to the bathroom in row 8 and a missing window in row 7. but. For row 7 and 11, the two last rows respectively, if you plan to work on these flights, those are probably your best seats since they have extra surface space besides them. A quick peek at the smart looking premium economy and then a detailed look at our seat. It's a fantastic seat and configuration which I reviewed many times with plenty of surface space and a nice storage bin. Of all of the Super Diamond seats, this one does probably though have the least amount of closed storage. Not sure why they didn't at least add a, a magazine rack or headphone hook on that rear surface if they weren't going to install a storage compartment. My only complaint about the seat is the, the physical seat itself. The seat coverings feel really worn and are starting to look the same. And compared to other similar seats, these definitely seem to have less padding. You could feel the the bones of the seat through the padding. Otherwise, they're great. There's a digital panel to control the seat. Inside the storage cubby, you'll find your in-flight entertainment remote, as well as a universal outlet, USB port, and headphone jack. There's a small storage space just below your armrest, and the armrest itself can telescope up and down.
The bulkhead seats seem to have quite a bit more space under and behind the TV, a bit more width than the standard configuration. There aren't any doors or anything like that installed, but privacy is decent with the rows offset. But that didn't really matter much since there were only three of us sitting in this rear cabin. For pre-departure drinks, we had a choice of water, orange juice, or sparkling wine. The captain apologized for the delay, twice, so Canadian of him, but also explained why we were late, which I appreciated, and the safety video began. That really is a beautiful engine. Air Canada brought this retro black and white livery back in 2017, and for the first day, I really wasn't a fan. But somehow, their old frosted leaf livery, the, the bluish green one, instantly looked dated to me in comparison from that point on. So now I actually really do love this one. Okay, we push back and taxi to the runway. The spool up, take off, and airport stats are coming up next. Before we get into the meal service, let's explore the in-flight amenities a bit, which were all a bit better than expected. The pillow was substantial and pretty much a household style pillow. Love this one. The blanket was more or less a proper duvet. It was a little bit scratchy, kind of reminded me of the American Airlines one, but it got the job done. There was also a mattress pad at each seat. As I always say, these thin ones, they don't do much, but something is always better than nothing. The headphones were fairly cheap, but at least they weren't super heavy. Quality was just okay. Later on in the flight, actually, I asked for an amenity kit because I assumed that they didn't proactively give them out for some reason. When I asked, I got a bit of a look from the flight attendant. At the time, I thought it was annoyance. But when putting this video together, I realized that many other seats had amenity kits at them when we boarded. So I wonder if she thought I was trying to get a second one. And I wonder who stole my original kit. Anyway, it's Aqua de Parma, and the pouch itself was one of the more useful ones out there. Hot towels were passed out, and the meal service was set to begin. Here's the full menu for the flight. Note that the prices in red are my addition to the menu to give you an idea of the wine value on board. 
My food tray was kind of plopped down in front of me and was all over the place. I always thought Air Canada served courses, but I guess on these later flights they just want to get you in and out ASAP. The starter ended up being tasty, but sounded like a strange combination with shrimp cocktail with cocktail sauce, a wasabi sauce, and pineapple. The main was hard to get down. It was a sliced veal tenderloin with pumpkin risotto and asparagus. On paper, totally up my alley, but that veal was like baby cow leather. Felt like it had been sitting in a warm oven for a few days. The risotto and asparagus flavor was okay, but it was just like mush. Behind that, we also had a cheese course, as well as a few pieces of bread. I don't know what was going on with that garlic bread. Finally, we ended with a raspberry cake, which tasted good, but looked like I got it from an elementary school bake sale. At least I did enjoy the Canadian red wine that they had on offer. I had a quick look at the bathrooms after the meal service. They were kept clean throughout the flight and had some nice products inside as well. As everyone else went to sleep, I started to explore the entertainment system on board, which was okay. But for a North American carrier, I was expecting a wider selection. In total, there are around 250 movies, as well as some other unique features like a readable newsfeed and a map covered in maple leaves, representing every destination that they fly to. Soon after that, I made up my bed and had a nap, but waited for some daylight to give you a look. Especially at the bulkhead, there's plenty of room. I know some complain about their knees hitting the table on this style of reverse herringbone when lying down, but I've never found that to be a big issue. Overall, a very comfortable bed. I woke up around 90 minutes out of London as the crew were already in the middle of the second service. Our tray came with a small fruit bowl, yogurt, and a very Burger King-esque croissant. That's not necessarily a dig. Burger King's croissant wishes were really good back in the day. The main dish, though, was worse than dinner. The eggs were almost okay, just a very weird texture. But the hash browns were like oil pillows, and that sausage. I don't think legally I'm allowed to say that they made it out of rubber. But also, I can't say for sure that it's not. It had the texture of Vietnamese fish cake, wrapped in like 12 layers of tofu skin and then baked, then boiled, then baked again. That's fine though, I was still kind of full from dinner, and we had an absolutely beautiful approach, which was way more important than airplane eggs. Views like this are why I love reverse herringbone seats. Being able to sit back from a distance and see the world go by as you descend is truly one of my happy places. Let's quickly talk about service. I'll be honest, it felt like decent service on any North American carrier. But for some reason, I was expecting something that was ever so slightly more put together and gracious. None of the crew were bad or rude or anything near that, but they were all just pretty short on all occasions. Sometimes it came off as a casual, familiar vibe, but sometimes it came off as a stop bothering me vibe. This might have been my fault for just expecting something more refined. If you head down to the description, you'll find my next five videos to come out, as well as other bits and pieces, like some other videos that I think you might enjoy. On your way down there, don't forget to subscribe. I release full-length videos every Thursday and Saturday. I'll let you enjoy the beautiful final descent as we approach London Heathrow from the northwest.
So overall, I think acceptable is a good way to describe the flight. The food was overall slightly below average, the crew was average, and the hard product was slightly above average. So when you put all that together, we get a very exciting average. Would I fly them again? Absolutely. Would I go out of my way to fly them again? Eh, probably not. I really do hope that you enjoyed this trip report today. If you did, please be sure to click that like button and subscribe to the channel with notifications on so you don't miss out on my twice weekly postings. I'll see you next time from the TRS Yucatan Resort in the Mayan Riviera. Oh, and as always, thanks for watching until the end.